Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Northcutt. I'm the middle school pastor here, and that means that I brought some props. And I'm going to need some participation. Uh, like Emily said, today you will hear that today is Generation Sunday from uh, lots of us because we love Generation Sunday. Generation Sunday is my favorite Sunday of the year. Emily reminded me first service when she came up and did the, the announcements that the reason Generation Sunday is my favorite Sunday of the year is because uh, Arcade is a family. And Arcade is my family. I have the, the privilege of being a, an Arcade child. I was brought here when I was young and I grew up here. And so uh, I get to talk a little bit about discipleship today. And as I have been thinking through the generations before me that have been part of discipling me, uh, there are so many of you in here that are part of the web that has captured me uh, with discipleship through, through your faith, uh, through you sharing your faith with me. And so I'm gonna try to illustrate how that's worked out in my life a little bit and see if I can beg you to come along and throw some webs at some people as you go. So I think most of us probably know Matthew 28, 19. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You guys know that one? Awesome, good. Uh, well, for me, that for a long time was a get out of doing work verse because it starts with go, and so if I'm not going on a missions trip or if I'm not going to do outreach or if I'm not going to discipleship where we sit down and we do discipleship through a book or a curriculum, then I don't have to do the rest of it because it's for people that are going to do that. A few years ago, I was at a conference and the speaker was uh, the president of Phoenix Seminary. His name's Dr. Daryl Del Hussey. And he took that verse and he broke it down for us in a way that really helped me see discipleship different. And I hope that it helps us see discipleship different. See, he broke that down. He said that beginning of that verse, that go therefore, it would be so much easier and so much better for us to understand if instead of go and therefore, it was as you go, make disciples. And that took the like get out of work thing away from me because you and I are a going people. We go to work, we go to the grocery store, we go to school most years. Um, we go to Little League, we take our kids to Little League, so as you go, make disciples. And then the next part is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I grew up with three brothers, and we did this any time we were in the pool. We baptized each other because, because it was fun. I don't know that it would work if they weren't my brothers, though. Like, I think I tried it on my cousins once, and they were like, no, you're trying to drown me. And then they tried to drown me, and it was no longer baptism. So uh, Dr. Darrell broke that part down, too. He said, as you go make disciples, immersing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let what comes out of you flood them with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit inside of you ooze out and immerse them. And that changes how I see that verse altogether because it's no longer like a, if I'm going to do discipleship, then I can participate. And it's no longer about just the water of baptism, but it's about how I can immerse people in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I'm a dad. I have a five-year-old, almost six, and a three-year-old son. And um, for me, discipling my kids looks different because of that. So as I go... I get to disciple them. I get to immerse them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So as we go and Jed, my three-year-old son, sees something beautiful for the first time that opens his eyes to some beauty of creation, I get to say, Jed, remember when we were reading in Genesis and God created? Remember how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created out of their love all of the beauty that we see? That's part of that beauty. That's part of that goodness. So I get to immerse Jed in that creation story. And then we'll be driving or walking or going somewhere and my five-year-old, he's very observant, he'll say, Dad, what, what is wrong with that person over there on the side of the road? And I'll say, that, 
Remember that story in Genesis where God created and he created man and said man is good and then a little bit later man decided to trust themselves instead of trusting God and sin came in and brokenness came in? That's what the brokenness is. When we see brokenness in our lives and the world around us. But don't worry, Thaddeus. God had a plan. He came, his son, Jesus, who wrote these words to us to pay for our wrong and then sent the Spirit to live in us, to live through us, and to live out in our community. I'm gonna see real quick if I can illustrate this with uh, my life, but it's really not about me because if we tugged on this string of discipleship all the way back, we'd go back to the author, the speaker of those words, go and make disciples. As you go, make disciples. So, like I said, I grew up here. We gotta go on a field trip, are you guys ready? All right. I grew up here, and I came to Arcade when I was in uh, first grade. And um, I came from another church, and I, I didn't want to come back to church. There's something happened at the church that I was at, and it was probably made up in my first grade imagination, but I was like, I don't want to go to church anymore. And I came, and Harrison, sorry, will you be Miss Paula for me? <laughs> Thank you. So I came in, who had Miss Paula in first grade? Lots of us, yeah. Yeah, and so I came in to Miss Paula's class, and Miss Paula uh, did exactly what Jesus said. She immersed us in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I don't really remember a lot of that, but I do remember Miss Paula every week saying, good morning, Andrew, how are you? And she knew my name, like Emily said, it means a lot, it made a big difference, and it drew me into the, the family, the web of Arcade Church. Let's see. I have this weird gap from um, after second grade. I don't remember any of my teachers. Heather, will you be my third grade Sunday school teacher? Were you my third grade Sunday school teacher? At VBS, see? <laughs> and I don't remember my fourth grade teacher. Jen, will you do that for me? Thank you, all right. And then, um, let's see, Michael, you're looking at me. Eye contact, you're turned around. Will you be my fifth grade Sunday school teacher? And, oh, you're, there we go. Sorry, sorry guys, we're making a web right here. We're all getting caught up in this. In fifth grade, I had a uh, Sunday school teacher. Can you mind holding this for me? Thank you, sir. All right, I, I don't remember anyone from third through fifth grade, but I know that the whole time that I was in third through fifth grade, every time I came on this campus, I was being immersed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and immersed in people's faith. They were handing me pieces of their web, drawing me into relationship with Christ. And I remember uh, getting into fifth grade, and, or sixth grade, and we had this awesome teacher. Hey, Paul, will you be my, my sixth grade teacher? Yeah, we had a teacher named Fred, and we um, were sixth grade boys, and so we didn't call him Fred, we called him Durf. It's Fred spelled backwards, we are very creative. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, in the whole time that we were teasing Fred for his name, he was immersing us in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, you're musical. <laughs> I went into seventh grade, um, and I met this guy who was awesome. Like, I thought, I, it's not like it used to be. I thought music used to be boring. It's not that way at all anymore, but my elementary brain thought music was boring, church music was boring, and I went into seventh grade in the middle school room, and there was this guy named Ryan Marcroft. He was playing acoustic guitar, and he was dancing around, and he was being silly and singing songs, and he uh, immersed me in what it, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can we go back this way, or should we uh, wrap up this way? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Yeah, Ryan, Ryan was awesome because in seventh grade, he was super fun and he taught me how to have fun worshiping. But then uh, he led the young adults worship service for a while when I was a little bit older. And he took that fun and he said, as, as the worship leaders, we need to have a huge, uh, deep spiritual component. And so he would immerse us outside of our practice. He would take us and he would do Bible study with us and immerse us in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, 
Um, when I got into high school, I met this man. Um, and he, he uh, showed me how to see people on the outskirts. Like, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere and like, we all notice that there's someone that no one's connecting to and they're out there. But most of us are like, yeah, someone else will talk to them. Uh, Victor is that man. And Victor uh, came into high school, the high school department when I was in high school, and he, out of nowhere, he would see the kid that was tucked in the corner that no one was wanting to participate with, and he would go out of his way to connect with them, with them to immerse them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to cast his web to them. And there was a time at the end of high school when I thought I was that outcast person. I thought I was on the outskirts, and I would come to campus, I would try to sneak into church at the end of second service so that I could get my church points, and somehow, <laughs> somehow Victor would see me. Like, he could be sitting here, and I would be over by the elementary building, and he would see me, and he would come out there, and he'd be like, Andrew, come in. Let me show you the Father, the Son, and how the Spirit has worked in my life. I had uh, the privilege of sitting down with Victor earlier this week and talking to him about his web because this is a bunch of connection points to me, but the reality is that every single one of these points have uh, webs going out in so many directions. Paula has a team of people that have been pouring into us for decades Glenn served with a bunch of rowdy middle schoolers for a long time. All of the people that I don't know their names, you might even be in here and be like, I remember you in third grade, Andrew. <laughs> All of you have webs that have gone out and drawn people in. And I sat with Victor and I just wanted to hear some of his story of, of how he was grabbed and pulled into the kingdom, into the body of Arcade. And he told me, he's like, hey, the, I think the first time I heard the gospel was my, my crazy sister. We grew up Catholic, and then my sister went and heard uh, the gospel, and it changed everything, and we thought she was crazy. We thought she joined a cult. She kept telling us about this Jesus and the Savior and this freedom, and we didn't want any of it. But that was the beginning of the spirit inside of his sister drawing him to this point, to where he's pouring into people. He told me, oh, wait, I have to give this to Jody. You're right there. Jody, he uh, told me that, that he came here, and you challenged him. He said that, that Catholic stuff you're believing is not the gospel. There's freedom and hope that, that you don't have right now that I want you to have. And Victor was interested in Jody. <laughs> and, uh, and so that wasn't the end, though, because Jody's dad, when they went on a, a date, they went and played golf, and Jody's dad began to pour the Father, the Son, and the Spirit into Victor. And then I was talking to Victor, and he... he uh, Sorry, we're going way over here to this service. Uh, he was telling me how when he first came here, he met a man named Jim and a man named Dan. Dan. He said, these two guys are awesome. We would sit down together, we'd eat pizza, and we'd read the Bible. Just drawing him more and more and more towards Christ. Immersing him in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I, I was trying to peek around to see if I could capture where different people are before service. And I think Dave Morford is up there, right? Shimmery hair, see it. Dave, uh, Victor was also telling me how you opened your house to him and, and did the same thing. And, and Dave, you've also done the same for me in my story, how you've poured into me, brought me into your house and immersed me in the good news of the gospel. I wonder what this web would look like if we all paused for a minute and said, okay, if I had some string and I looked around this room or I looked at the people in my life, the people that grabbed me, that wrapped me up, that brought me to Jesus, where would it go? Because I'm sure that all of us, if you're here, have a web that brought us here. And I hope that most of us, I hope that all of us, if you're here, have a web going out pouring into other people. Before I pass this to Beth uh, to untangle it or tighten it up and draw us all along together, I wanna challenge you guys. I had 
the best time sitting down with Victor earlier this week and just hearing of the good news of the people that have poured into him faithfully for generations. Every time I look back at my story, I love to think of all the people that have impacted me for the kingdom. So I would challenge each and every one of us to pause for a minute and say, okay, who are those people that have impacted me? Who are those people that I encountered? It may have been for a brief time, but while I was with them, they were just pouring out the good news of Jesus. Think through those people, write them down. If you're like me and you have the opportunity to call that person and say, hey, can we sit and talk? I would challenge you to do that because I promise it is enriching. Beth, are you ready to take this? Here you go. We have, we have string left this time. We have string this time. Thank you, Andrew. Isn't this awesome? Woo! So, Emily, I don't know where you are, but you're right. We are just going to keep talking about Generation Sunday. And like Andrew, I love this Sunday. How fun is it to be in this room together and hear stories of so many generations here at Arcade? But I thought it would be kind of fun to look at some of the stereotypes of our generations. Now, stereotypes are just for fun. I looked them up on the internet, so they're true. And if you have complaints, just take them to Google, because they're from Google, not from me. So as I call out your generation, I need to hear from you so we can kind of look around and see what generations are represented. Okay, are you ready? All right, the silent generation is first. You are 76 to 93 years old, and apparently you are the silent generation. <laughs> Our silent generation, the stereotypes uh, Google said of you are you're extremely proud Americans, you take responsibility for your family's well-being, and you believe in the need for authority. Next up, baby boomers. Okay, there we go, there we go. You are 57 to 75 years old, and you are highly competitive in the workplace, parents of a classic American family, and you think you're in touch with technology, but you're not. Hate to break it to you. Um, okay, where's my people at? Gen X. Woo, yeah. We're 41 to 56 years old, and we're America's neglected middle child. Aww. Uh, Google said we're overly independent, divorced, and negative cynics. I'm so offended. That is not even true. All right, next up is probably the most maligned generation, millennials. You're 25 to 40 years old. I heard the phrase geriatric millennial. Like, really? You're 40 and whatever. Um, anyway, millennials are obsessed with avocado toast. <laughs> you set unrealistic expectations, including the expectation to get a trophy for literally everything. And you actually are tech savvy. <laughs> Last but not least, Gen Z, you're 0 to 24. There we go. Okay, we have some excited Gen Zers. You're constantly on social media. You're obsessed with popularity and you can't wait for the next TikTok dancer trend, which if you wait 30 seconds, a new one will pop up. But all joking aside, okay, remember these are from Google, they're not from me, so don't be offended, please. <clears throat> it's all joking and in fun. But I bet many of you have a story like Andrew, right? You can probably think of at least one person who, as they went along, they immersed you in the truth of who Jesus is. And we're going to keep talking about the joy and blessings of generations, but first, I'd like us to pray together. God, would you, would you open our eyes to your word, to your spirit? Would you, would you allow us to hear um, what you have for us today? Please help me to say only the things you want me to and, and nothing else. Be honored and glorified. Amen. Uh, we're going to start in Psalm 145. So kids, if you want to grab a blue Bible, it's on page 524. And we decided as a team, we had to highlight Andrew's discipleship web because it's just such a cool story. And then as we were looking for scripture, we found Psalm 145, and we couldn't help but land there today. So page 524, if you have a blue Bible 
or you can find it on your app. You're on your own. All right. Will you read with me? I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. This is the word of the Lord. So I have the pleasure of working with and leading the Arcade Kids team. This is an incredible group of disciple makers. And if you're in the room, I want to say thank you. You're incredible. The way that you teach Arcade Kids the truth of the gospel helps me understand the gospel better. And I was thinking about, you know, if we were over in our kids' building, how do we approach today? And I, I think we would start by defining some of these words because... When was the last time you used the word extol in casual conversation? Just doesn't happen, right? So let's start with some of these definitions. Extol means to praise enthusiastically. Unsearchable means not capable of being searched or explored or inscrutable, which we might need to look up later. Commend means to praise formally or officially. Splendor is magnificent and splendid appearance or grandeur. And proclaim means to announce officially or publicly. Knowing what these words mean will help us understand this passage a little better. And next in RK Kids, especially if Mr. John is teaching, he would put giant pieces of paper on the wall and hand the small group leaders some markers and we would divide up into small groups. So we're gonna divide up into groups by generations. Just kidding, we can't really do that in here. But I am gonna have some crowd participation. So I want you to think about one reason why you think God is worthy of our praise. And when I count to three, we're gonna shout it out. So think of a reason why you think God is worthy of praise. Are you ready? Okay, one, two, three. Oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. I, I pulled some things out of this passage. God is great beyond our a comprehension and understanding, his works and mighty acts are worth telling the next generation about. He has glorious, majestic splendor. He has wonderful and awesome works, great deeds, abundant goodness, righteousness. Wow. But did you catch how these verses said, they speak of your mighty deeds. They pour forth your fame. Can you put a name into the they? For me, it's Mrs. Ballinger, a widow Sunday school teacher who told me the works of the Lord. Tiffany, a friend since high school who loved me in a really, really difficult time in my life when I felt like nobody else was loving me. She loved me the way Jesus did. Sophia, a lady who babysat for us, she would constantly share the miraculous ways God met her needs. Pastor Craig, the first to teach me to celebrate true freedom in the gospel. My daughters who commend the Lord's justice to me. And then there's the countless people here at Arcade who have helped us declare the goodness of the Lord to our kids. From Mrs. Asher and Miss Roberta to Peter Zamora, Miss Paula, Miss Dorothy, John, Sally, Stefan, Kelly, Julie, and Mike. And then you heard from Andrew how one generation declared and is declaring the goodness of God. Andrew and Allie know all three of my daughters and have spent countless hours and countless cups of coffee hanging out with them as they go along, immersing them in the goodness of God. But there's also women from different generations here at Arcade who have personally really impacted me. Joyce, Marianne, Elaine, Debbie, 
Sonia, Pat, I could go on. I've probably left most of you out. You'd probably be on my list too. If you have your notes, I've left a place for you to write a name. You can pull it up on your app too. And I asked this question that's totally grammatically incorrect, but who is your they? Like Andrew said, who, who's a part of your web? Who's poured into you as they've gone along? I've listed a few of the names of people who've thrown the ball of yarn to me. And as you heard, it was coming from different angles, different generations, brothers and sisters in Christ, relationships inside the church and outside it. But the telling, speaking, celebrating can't end with me. I can't hoard the string. It, it's not string. It's the truth and beauty of the gospel. So as I learn, as I, as I discover how good God is, as he's been faithful to me, I have to share it. I have to pass the string to someone else. And then you know what? Maybe they'll do the same thing. Hopefully, if I've actually been living my life like this, someone has written my name as their they. And while I can fill up the day, like literally the rest of the day, but we have food trucks coming, with how good God is and then celebrate what he's done, let me start with this. When I was dead in my sin, Jesus called me out of the grave. Before I was even a twinkle in my parents' eyes, God had chosen me to be holy and blameless in his sight. Jesus clothed me in his righteousness, and I was declared not guilty by his Father, the creator of the universe. Jesus is with me always, always, right now, and tomorrow, and the day after that, and forever and ever and ever. And the Holy Spirit is a deposit. He's not just a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance, as if that wasn't enough. He also dwells in me, convicting me of my sin, guiding my thoughts, and compelling me to right action. I could go on and on and on. I haven't even testified how good and faithful God has been to my family in tangible, real ways. But let's switch gears a little. We've heard what, what David the psalmist thinks about God's goodness. We've heard from Pastor Andrew and his web of disciple making. And I've reminded you how good God is through the truth of the gospel. But as I've been preparing this, I've been reflecting on some questions, and I wanted us to reflect on them together. Do you believe the Lord is great and worthy to be praised? What has he done for you that you can't help but tell someone about? We saw Daniel get baptized. That's just the beginning of his declaring God's goodness to him. Did you wake up this morning? Obviously, that's a gift from him. That breath in your lungs, that's his goodness. A baby's laugh, a hug from a friend. My goodness, have you seen Lake Tahoe? That is just a glimpse of God's goodness to us. But let's get serious. The way he meets our needs, his grace and mercy, the way he deals gently with us, abundant goodness. Your salvation, that is a mighty act of the Lord. But, but hold on, time out. Got a lot of church kids in here, right? Grew up in a Christian home. You were in church every time the door was open. You have awesome Christian parents. You've made mostly right decisions. And you think your testimony is boring. Listen to me. There is no boring testimony. Your conversion is just as radical and miraculous as Paul's on the road when Jesus interrupted him. You were dead, not just kind of dead, not, not sort of dead. You were dead in your sins, and Jesus called you out of the grave. So let me ask you again, do you believe the Lord is great and worthy to be praised? Yeah, me too. Okay, so what if we flip these questions a little bit and ask this? What are you declaring to other generations? Maybe instead of the Lord's deeds, 
you're declaring your deeds or your generation's deeds. But this not only divides and separates, it leaves no room for the shared awe and wonder of God's goodness. We can clap and cheer and whoop in here, but what if it makes it no further than the doors of the sanctuary? Or if you're at home, what if it stays with you on the couch? What if it goes into my mind and my heart and I shove it in my pocket and it goes no further? I couldn't help but think of the kid's song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And then what do we sing? Hide it under a bushel. That's right, we know we're supposed to say no, but how are we living? How are we living? How am I living? You know, we, we wrote down or thought about someone who is our they. I've been asking myself, could someone write my name down? Could someone write your name down? Are you someone's they? One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. They tell of the power of your awesome works. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. But now what? What if... What if we ask God to open our eyes to the beauty in other generations? Yes, we are all irritated by other generations' quirks and tendencies and music. I mean, have you heard a Post Malone song? Am I right? Sorry, Gen X. I mean, Gen Z. Um, yeah, anyways. Um, but maybe instead of rolling our eyes, we could learn from each other. We've had this terrible year. Okay, it's been more than a year. It's been bad, it's been depressing, it's been full of grief and anguish and sorrow and fighting and ah, it's been so bad. But what if my generation and those younger look to the older generations who've lived through a depression and wartime and more grief and sorrow and heartache than we could even imagine? Do you think we could learn something? And maybe you're in the older generation, and, and as you're going along, and you're immersing younger generations in the truth of who God is, maybe you could learn something too. Yeah, techie things like a three-finger swipe on a Mac, or how to actually airdrop a photo, or well, who in the world is this Post Malone guy, but more important things too. Maybe you would find out why the younger generation cares so much about fighting racism and about justice. Instead of mocking and stereotyping the other generations, what if we saw them for who they really are? Image bearers of God. People with stories of God's love towards them. Sacred siblings who bear burdens, who stumble, who get back up because the truth of God's faithfulness learned from the word, but also from one another. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds but would keep his commands. Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, okay, Beth, whatever, I'm new to Arcade, or I've been coming to Arcade for 40 years and I only know people my age. I don't know how to get connected to other generations. Well, guess what? I have a list. Are you ready? In the fall, host a gather group. If you don't know what a gather group is, talk to Pastor Cole. They are awesome. It is a great way to get connected with others. If you can't host one, join one. Pastor Cole's the guy for that. Ladies, we had a women's gather night last month. There were like 65 of us here. It was that weird, windy, stormy day, and it was a blast. There was a mama there with her one-month-old baby and a 98-year-old saint and everyone in between, and the conversation was so loud, you almost had to yell at each other to hear. It was so much fun. We're having another one, June 18th. Don't miss it. Talk to Nick and Andrew about discipling students. If you don't live under a rock, you know this world we live in is just getting darker and darker, and our kids need to hear the truth of God's. He's like got this unbroken streak of faithfulness, and they need to hear that. Serve in the nursery. If you're older, get to know younger parents. If you're younger, get to know people who are a few steps ahead of you in life. Okay, this next one's kind of crazy. 
So I'm going to say it, and I trust that we'll still be friends after I say it. Are you ready? Switch where you sit in the sanctuary. And I know, I know we're Baptists. I know that pew has your imprint on it. But what if you sit over here and you sat over here one Sunday? Or if you sit up there, come down and sit down here and maybe strike up a conversation with the people around you. Get to know somebody you've never seen before. You know what? Sometimes I meet people at Arcade. I'm like, oh, are you new? And they go, no, I've been here for five years. Let's bump into each other more often and be intentional about it. Okay, and then that one might have seemed crazy, but I think this next one is switch services. Did you know the 9 and 11 o'clock service are identical? Same music, same announcements, same message, different people. And then, of course, I have to say, Arcade Kids Sunday morning is so much fun. We sing. We dance. I think I'm allowed to say that. We have a blast. And can I tell you the joy that comes when you see a child's eyes light up with the truth of the gospel? We need you on our team. It's so fun. So come hang out with us on Sunday mornings. And then, of course, Kids Camp. You heard how easy it is to sign up for that. Come serve at Kids Camp. It's five days. Yeah, you'll be exhausted on Friday, but just take a nap. It's fine. It's great. And, and all these things are future things, right? They're at least a week away. But there's something you can do today. You heard Emily and Jen say that there's food trucks in the courtyard. Stay. You know you're going to eat lunch anyways, right? Stick around. If you have a few extra bucks, buy somebody lunch who you don't know. Hey, can I buy you lunch? Have a conversation with someone, not the same six people you always have a conversation with. I'm the same way. Find someone new. Find someone with a little more gray hair or a little less gray hair than you and strike up a conversation with them. That's today. It's going to be a blast. There's games set up. It's so much fun. So that's today. Stick around. I'm going to close in prayer. Would you pray with me? God, you created generations, and you spoke of generations in your word. And you told us we need to declare your goodness from one generation to another, on and on and on. Would you help us as a church to do that? Would you give us eyes for other generations the way you see them? Not with preconceived ideas, but with the love that comes from knowing you. Would you overflow that into each other? God, would you bless our lunchtime today? Would you help us to have a blast? Would you help us all to meet at least one new person and, and get connected in a new way today? May the merciful and compassionate God shower you with his unfailing love as you tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. Amen. Have a good Sunday. See you in the courtyard. Yeah.